Uh, Julian uh, did his graduate work at Berkeley under the uh, advisement of Chris McKee. He uh, followed that up with a, a postdoc at the prestigious Institute for Advanced Study. After that, he did some postdocs at some other okay places, Harvard and MIT. <laughs> and uh, uh, then he started as a faculty member at Johns Hopkins, where he's been for many, many years. He uh, is an expert in high energy astrophysics. He uh, is probably best known for his work on accretion uh, uh, and uh, cre black hole, particularly black hole accreting sources. And I would say even in particular in, in the work, his work on active galactic nuclear, active galactic, hard for me to say. AGN. Active, <laughs> AGN, <laughs> active galactic nucleuses, you know, uh, which, he literally wrote, which he literally wrote the book on. So uh, today he's gonna tell us about some stuff to do, to do with uh, accreting black hole systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. In regard to the uh, pr pronounceable form of active galactic nuclei, I think I should quote the discussion with my wife when it was time to choose the specific title for the book. And she thought it would really help sales if I could somehow get, it on, get to be interviewed on Oprah. <laughs> and so she proposed to the editor at Princeton University Press that it should be titled Sexually Active Galactic <laughs> Nuclei. <laughs> It didn't fly, <laughs> what can I say? Um, anyway, so um, the title for today's talk bears a little bit of explanation. Um, the first is about the wording. And what, of course what I'm gonna talk about in reality is the structure and dynamics of processing and aligning accretion disks. But I live in Baltimore, and as many of you know, there's a sizable medical establishment in Baltimore. And so these words just creep into your mind. And I thought this might be a little more, um, a little more vivid description of what's going on. But there's also a second linguistic comment, which is that upon arrival in the airport Tuesday evening, I uh, recalled that, yes, Canada is a separate independent country. And amongst other things, it has its own independent spelling rules. And so in honor of the location, I will do my best to spell it Canadian style from here on out. Um, maybe even say out. <laughs> uh, uh, or other. <laughs> yeah, and the last comment is that you know, real credit goes where credit's due. And the hard work here was they tell me about numerical simulations. The code is John Hawley's and Karina Serafia, um, who was my postdoc until um, earlier this year, carried out the actual simulations and did so very successfully. Um, so I'll begin by reminding you that accretion disks are found in many, many contexts and many, many varieties. Um, everywhere from protoplanetary systems to um, binary mass transfer systems. You know, we have real images of planets. We have artists' conceptions of mass transfer systems since they're not really resolvable. And you ha even have, of course, disks around the supermassive black holes at the hearts of AGN, uh, for which we have artists' fantasies. I think this is a, the fairest description of that image. Although we'd like often to imagine that everything is lined up in a simple geometry, that's not necessarily the case. There are many assembly mechanisms you can think of in which the orientation of the orbital plane of the disk is misaligned, is it oblique, to the natural orientation of the gravitating object onto which the stuff is accreting, um, set by its angular momentum. And you know, all of these, you can imagine, might have that effect. A protostellar binary might well form with the two stars orbiting a certain plane, and as it accretes matter from the surrounding molecular cloud, that could come in tilted. Um, in the case of a galactic black hole binary, there's no particular relation, at least initially, between the orbital plane of the binary and the spin axis of the black hole. In the case of accretion onto an AGN, perhaps even more so, you create a black hole with a certain spin, it's on much, much smaller scales than anything determining the net angular momentum of nearby interstellar material, and they too can be wholly unrelated. Um, occasionally, massive black holes 
um, find stars too close to them to survive. And they tidally shred the star that um, passes too close. There's almost certainly no way for the orientation of the orbit of, of that star to have anything to do with the spin of the black hole. You know, in the other cases, you can imagine over long periods of time accreting enough matter to coordinate things, but certainly not in the case of a tidal disruption. And then the last, which is of particular interest to uh, people interested in gravitational waves, is the question of sort of the multiple alignments in the case of a binary black hole on its way towards ultimate merger, surrounded by orbiting material. And in that case, there's the orientation of the orbital plane of the disk, there's the orientation of the orbital plane of the binary. There's the orientation of each of the spins of the two black holes. There are four different things that all could have various um, directions relative to one another. And understanding how they evolve is important because the relative orientation of the black hole spins and the orbital plane makes a major difference to the nature of the gravitational wave waveform that's ultimately radiated and also to the properties of the merger that results. Now, the basic fact of life about these tilts between disk orbital planes and the angular momentum of the central system is that generically they create torques. And the character of the torque is that it's proportional to the, and this is a rephrase in a slightly um, artful way, but at least in the, you can write it as proportional to the cross product of the angular momentum of the central object, J, and the angular momentum of a ring of orbiting gas, L. And because it's a cross product, the torque is not just sort of any old torque. It specifically leads to a precession. It's always perpendicular to both angular momentum. The second fact that's generic, whether it, the effect is lens tearing torque here, the general relativistic effect, or due to the quadrupole moment of binary, is that in both cases, there's a rather steep dependence on radius. And what that means is that the precession frequency <coughs> increases very rapidly inward. And it's an interesting question. What happens at those smallest radii where the precession is not just the fastest, but there's also the sharpest gradient in the precession frequency and therefore the precession angle. Neighboring rings tr process at quite different rates and so if they were independent of one another, would very quickly become twisted with respect to each other. Now, I'm not the first person to think about this. <laughs> uh, this is a very partial list of references on the subject of how um, differentially processing disks may or may not align. It goes back initially to Bernie and Pedersen, now nearly 40 years ago, who thought of it in terms of the lens tearing torque of a black hole on its surrounding accretion disk. And you know, dozens and dozens of papers ever since. And the general conclusion, I think, that everyone shares is that somehow or other, in those inner rings where the uh, differential precession is greatest, that there'd be some kind of friction, a little nature unspecified, that would result in the system quieting down into the only quiet configuration it can take, which is, which is for the orbital plane of the accretion disk close in to lie in the equatorial plane of the central object's angular momentum, for example, the black hole spin, and then there's no longer any torque. So that's... Why would it Pardon? Why would it yeah. Okay. And the question is, how, and um, just... Before talking about sort of where we want to go with this, I want to explain the basic dynamical mechanism that underlines, underlies almost everything that happens in warp disks. And that is, if you imagine a situation like this in which 
the, e the mean disk plane is here, horizontal. And now you warp that disk. So you move little segments up and or down with respect to one another, beginning from a state in which each of them is in a state, is in hydrostatic equilibrium vertically. So these little red lines you might imagine is the position of a, of a scale height from the midplane. If they're displaced in this way, you can immediately see that the contours of pressure no longer line up with one another. And suddenly, there are radial pressure contrasts. Here, you know, the, there'll, there'll be a fluid force this way. Here, it'll be that way. And so you go from a state, um, the state that obtains in a flat disk, in which it's in good pressure balance radially, this thin, to a state in which there are rather strong local radial pressure contrasts. And of course, what do radial pressure gr contrasts do? They drive radial motions in the fluid. Those radial motions can mix the misaligned angular momentum because, you know, they carry their angular momentum with them and, the un and then ultimately you can imagine that the fluid streams um, either physically, in a sort of kinetic sense, mix with the local fluid or the pressure forces that are induced will end up in effect mixing the momentum and the disk might try to realign itself by that means. There's a useful way of describing how severe these warps are. Um, actually goes back to uh, about a dozen years ago to a paper by Nelson and uh, Jean Papaloisu. If you begin by thinking about the warp rate, the rate at which the orientation angle changes per log radius, and then scale that in units of the disk aspect ratio, the scale height and ratio of the radius. What that ratio tells you about, essentially, is whether the contrast in angle over one e-fold in radius amounts to an altitude difference of a scale height or more. Okay. You can see from this picture that when the contrast is at least a scale height, then there are order unity pressure gradients on that length scale. So this psi hat parameter essentially tells you about the strength of the warp in useful units and in a certain sense um, when this quantity psi hat is greater than one that the warp is quote nonlinear. Okay, so now um, where do we want to go from here? We have an, a basic That's right, but in many, many accretion disks, self-gravity is not important. So and for my purposes, I'm going to forget it. it just, these are light disks. Yeah. Okay, so given this mechanism, you know, what are the questions you'd like to ask about how it works? And of course, the first obvious one is, well, if you induce radial flows, how fast do they go? How far do they get? Second, um, I spoke earlier about this sort of hand wavy, quote, friction that somehow aligns the, the inner rings in the equatorial plane. Uh, how is that going to work in particular if the only new angular momentum coming to the system is from the torque? And locally, the torque is always perpendicular to the local angular momentum. How do you ever cancel the misaligned part? You know, if you add a you know, component that's perpendicular to the vector, you don't do any cancellation at all. So we're, how does that work? Um, assuming that you can answer the question one and two, there's a further question of presumably any, pro any process associated with this happens first at the inner radii and later at outer radii just because everything happens faster. All those times the precession rate is, the well, sharing is r to the minus three, so everything happens faster at the inner radii. So if you align the inner disk first and then the outer disk, there must be some transition radius where you go from aligned to misaligned. And can we predict where that is and whether that transition is sharp or, or gradual? Okay. Now, there is a traditional approach to answering all these questions, which I like to speak of as alphaology. This is an old and honorable business. It's, you know, in the phrase of a shop front established 1973. 
um, in the you know really important and significant and really genuinely brilliant Shakura Sinyaya paper of 1973. And there's essentially two parts to the story. Um, the first of them is just a review for those of you who are not disk specialists of what this alpha stuff is all about. And this will set the context for the second part um, in the where it moves into the context of tilted disks. Okay, so you have stuff orbiting some central object. And the only way matter is going to move radially is if it changes angular momentum. So nothing happens. There's no accretion unless ma material orbiting in this disk can somehow lose angular momentum and move inward. Momentum fluxes um, are stresses. And so somehow there has to be some kind of internal stress within the disk. And the question, and the question as it stood in 1973 was, what is this mechanism? Or even if we can't guess the actual nature of the mechanism, can we guess its rough scale? And the answer given by Shakur and Sinaya was that just on the basis of dimensional analysis, you might expect it to have the scale of the only quantity they could think of that was relevant to the problem and have the units of stress, and that would be the local pressure inside the disk. So they suggested that the stress would be some number, al some dimensionless number alpha times the local pressure. Um, they thought that alpha might be less than, or, but not too much less than unity. And to be more particular, they applied this only in a sort of looser context where they were looking at time steady, axisymmetric um, disks in which really all they cared about um, was vertically integrated quantities. Not the local density, but the surface density. Not the local pressure, but the pressure integrated vertically. Not the local stress, but the stress integrated vertically. So they assumed a lot of averaging in this approach. And in the paper, they remarked on a number of candidate mechanisms. Um, they waved their hands about turbulent uh, diffusion of angular momentum, about magnetic fields. They commented on a number of things, but they had no way of singling out any one mechanism as the most likely. The one thing they did say is that um, conventional molecular viscosity was absolutely hopeless. <laughs> orders and orders and orders of magnitude too weak to have any reasonable effect. And that's true by the very same fact that makes the disk stuff behave like a fluid. It just results from the fact that the mean free paths are small compared to the disk thickness. Okay. Now, this was a very popular idea because with this onsatz, with this guess about the integrated stress, you could then go ahead and solve for the radial profile of surface density in, one of the, in a time steady disk, applying only conservation laws, mass, angular momentum, energy, and your home. Gives you the surface density profile and also the surface brightness profile. Okay. Now, despite the language in the paper pointing out that molecular viscosity could not possibly be the actual mechanism. Nonetheless, for many, many people in the you know, 38 years since then, <coughs> it's been somehow imagined as some kind of viscosity. People will speak about alpha viscosity as if this were some magical new variety of kinetic transport um, that was you know, special to accretion disks and was incredibly stronger than normal molecular viscosity. Okay, I, I haven't done the research, the linguistic research to trace it back to its first use. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I point this out to remark, first of all, you can't blame Shakur and Sinyaya for it. <laughs> um, and second, that in the tilted problem in particular, thinking about it as a viscosity is extremely misleading. Okay. This takes me to alphaology part two, which is, you know, despite what I've just said, virtually all the work in this field you know, since 1975 
has in fact been in the framework of supposing that there is some magical viscosity that operates within accretion disks that is A, isotropic, and B, has a local magnitude that's proportional to the local pressure. Okay. And if you have such a viscosity, then what it does is to curb the vertical shear of these radial flows. If we maybe flip back to the little cartoon, you can see that there will be a rapid radial flow here, a not so rapid radial flow there, so there's vertical shear. And the job of this alpha viscosity was to control the amplitude of the radial velocity due to this um, viscous effect. Now when you do that, you can construct a sort of lumped parameter model of the whole system in which warps and disks diffuse at a rate controlled by a new parameter they call alpha 2, whose magnitude is inversely proportional to the viscous output. The reason for that is that the larger the, the quote viscous alpha, the slower those radial flows, and therefore the slower the radial mixing of angular momentum, and the slower those warps will diffuse away and the disk will flatten itself. That's why it's inversely proportional. Okay. Now, the modern approach, 20 years almost younger than Shakura and Sunyaev, stems from the equally influential, well, I don't know equally, but certainly extremely influential work by Steve Balbus and John Hawley, in which they pointed out that MHD turbulence is almost certainly the real mechanism of angular momentum transport in disks. And again, to you know, sort of bring everyone onto the same page, the content of the Balbus and Hawley idea was first that in extremely general conditions, in any disk material with enough conductivity to make the MHD approximation good, in which the orbital frequency declines outward, and I challenge you to find a realistic gravitational potential that breaks this one, um, and in which the plasma beta is greater than one, that is to say the ratio of gas pressure to magnetic pressure is greater than one, there is this, quote, magnetorotational instability that grows on the orbital time scale. The fastest growing wavelength, to be precise, grows on the orbital time scale. So that's very rapid. Its net result, as shown in how many hundreds of numerical simulations since, is to amplify the field from an initially very, if it's very weak, it can be amplified quite a lot. Um, and at the end of the day, the same orbital shear that actually drives the instability also correlates the radial and the azimuthal components of the magnetic field in exactly the right sense so that angular momentum is transported outward. And in a kind of cartoon version, you can see how this works by looking at a little figure like this. Here is a massive object. Here is um, some fluid element, small radius, and traveling this, this angular velocity. Fluid element at larger radius, traveling at slower angular velocity. And they happen to be connected by a field line. Now, this one's traveling faster in an angular sense, so it races ahead and stretches that field line. But magnetic field lines have an effective tension just from the fact, you imagine stretching a flux tube, um, you increase the energy of the flux tube because the intensity stays the same and you're increasing its volume. So it's an effective tension, and an effective tension here will retard this one, accelerate this one, i.e., it creates a torque that transports angular momentum from small radius to large. So it does the job. And now you might ask, given that we think we understand the actual physics of stress in flap disks, so this is the mechanism for accretion in flap disks. We haven't yet talked about tilted things. Um, in what sense do MHD stresses correspond to this imagined alpha viscosity model? In so there is one sense in which 
they match up reasonably. And that is, if you look at long-term time averages of vertically integrated properties, the saturated stress does appear to be a fairly constant number times the integrated pressure. Um, exactly why this is so remains a matter of, shall we say, continued research. Um, the generality of what that ratio may, may be is also, I think, a little wobbly, but it's something like that. So for order of magnitude estimates of time average properties, you know, fixed alpha is not a bad approximation. But um, as Steve Balbus likes to say, any time you put alpha through a, a, a derivative, you run into trouble. If you try to match them locally, it just doesn't look anything at all alike. The local magnetic stresses are simply not proportional to the local in terms of position and time value of the shear. They're not proportional, again, in that local sense to the pressure. There are all kinds of gradients and time fluctuations and everything else that complicate those relations. And they're certainly not isotropic. You know, it's a magnetic field, so why would you expect it to be isotropic? But in many ways, it's an anisotropic effect. Start with the fact that these components are generically quite different in magnitude from one another. The azimuthal is almost always the largest, typically a factor of several greater than uh, the radial, which in turn is a factor of several greater than the vertical one, typical situations. Um, I already mentioned that orbital shear creates an anisotropy through that special R phi correlation. But there's also another one. Remember, the job that was sought for this alpha viscosity was to control the vertical shear of radial flows. Now, the fundamental, simplest mode for the magnetorotational instability is to take a vertical field, look at axisymmetric perturbations that involve wiggles of the field in the radial direction. In other words, this is a situation in which you have a radial velocity with a vertical shear. It's unstable with a growth rate of order of the orbital frequency. This is not the world's best candidate for restraining those flows. So for the purpose of the local time dependent, et cetera, a question of what controls radial flows and tilted disks, alpha viscosity is actually quite distant in character from the way MHG stresses operate. It, yeah. There's this paper by Torkelson. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have not taken the time to figure out what went wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. But I'll g here's another example from a, a global simulation of, in another way, that the, the lump parameter and alpha-based description just doesn't match what happened. In a, kind of, in a preliminary simulation, Sarathia, Holly, and I took a flat, purely hydrodynamic disk, imposed a warp on it, and then just let it relax. We wanted to see how pure hydrodynamics, no MHD and certainly no viscosity, would relax a warp. And this figure shows you some data from that simulation. The solid curve is this psi hat parameter measured at the radius that was right in the middle of the warp. So it started large, um, actually went to sort of opposite sign, and then decayed into um, a linear bending wave oscillation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is data taken from the radial shell um, in the middle of the warp. The dashed curve is a scaled version of the radial flux of misaligned angular momentum. And in a diffusion model, what you would expect is that this flux of angular, radial flux of angular momentum should be minus some diffusion constant times the gradient of orientation. Okay. And what you can see is that just not what's going on. <laughs> um, first of all, there's a time delay between the flux and the gradient, about an orbit. That's not surprising. You start, you, you create a gradient. It takes a while for the acceleration to bring the stuff up to speed. <laughs> 
but then if you look at the details, what you can also see is that um, even in the linear regime, it doesn't track it. And in particular, this radial flux declines much more sharply um, than you'd expect from a linear scaling. And in fact, one of the principal results of this, of this simulation was the recognition that the Reynolds stress, the flux of moment rate, uh, angular momentum carried by these radial flows, is actually a very strong function of that psi hat parameter and increases sharply when psi hat exceeds unity. And you can see sort of a signature of that in the behavior of this curve. So in all these respects, time delay, nonlinear behavior, sort of, uh, sort of loose correspondence and magnitude to the magnet local magnitude of the gradient, it doesn't work. It's not behaving diffusively. Okay, so having argued that the simple viscous fluid model just is not appropriate to the problem, let's turn to doing it right with MHD. The unfortunate fact is that you know, there is no good analytic theory of turbulence, and so you're immediately plunged into doing large-scale numerical simulations. And I think there are probably a number of people in this room with some, simula with some simulation experience uh, who know how much effort that is. <laughs> this problem is actually especially difficult in a number of ways. Um, one is that it is intrinsically global. I mean, Shane mentioned the paper which tried to mock up a warp with a shearing box, and there are just so many artificialities introduced by that. I'm not even sure how to interpret those results in a global context. Um, it's also fully 3D, you know, even in a flat disk, because the sort of zeroth order property properties are all axisymmetric. You can do a lot, you can save a lot in computing by, let's say, simulating only a quarter of the azimuthal range, replicating that periodically, and taking it from there. So you save a factor of four in you know, computer requirements right there. It won't work in a warped, twisted disk. That's fully 3D, no symmetries. Um, another difficulty is that if you want to look at relatively thin disks, you need to get, you need to have high enough resolution in the disk plane to describe the MHD turbulence well. And that requires cells that are quite a small fraction of a scale height. Um, typically, less than 3% of a scale height is sort of bare minimum, and you're better off doing better than that. And here, where the disk plane is changing from place to place, that means you have to cover a relatively large portion of the volume with high-resolution cells. So this is, so the question is, how can you do this in a feasible way? And we made a number of strategic choices in order to make it possible. The first of them was to approximate the dynamics as Newtonian plus the lowest order post-Newtonian term to describe the lens tearing torque. And that's just because Newtonian codes run faster than relativistic codes. A second is it seemed to us that the crucial physics was not so much the actual ratio of the precession rate to the orbital frequency near the transition radius, so much as it was the fact that the, the precession frequency should be generally a good deal smaller than the orbital frequency. By going Newtonian, we were freed from having the, cor quote, correct relation between spin and, and distance and precession rate, and so we arbitrarily chose the precession frequency to be actually a little bit less than a tenth of the orbital frequency in the middle of the disk. That also has the practical advantage that, you know, you've got to have a time step that's a small fraction of an orbital period. If the precession rate is really small compared to the orbital frequency, you have to integrate many, many orbital periods. So you just have to go, you know, integrate forever <laughs> in order to see the precession do anything. This makes things happen at a time scale that's, that's possible to follow. We also you know, would like to understand thin disks, but I said it's harder to resolve them the thinner they get. And so we took a compromise of H over R. Of, it's actually a little bit less than a tenth. It varies between 0.06 and 0.1. And we took all the computational savings from these things into making sure that we had 
the resolution to describe the MHD properly. And even with all these tricks and artifices, uh, it still cost more than a million processor hours, which is you know, about the scale of what's practical. You can go up to a, maybe a few million these days and do it in a reasonable human time scale, but it's about where it sits. Okay. Now, the specific calculation that we did was to begin with a hydrostatic torus that had a range of radii about a factor of three. Um, I said h over r a little less than a tenth. A weak magnetic field that was purely dipolar with a bunch, basically, a bunch of nested magnetic field lines that followed the density contours in the hydrostatic torus. And to make a hydrostatic torus, the surface density varies with radius in such a way that there's a peak in surface density more or less in the middle of the disk, which we placed at radius 10. So we ran this system for 15 orbits just to let the MHD turbulence grow up and saturate. And then at that point, with the MHD turbulence in place, we turned on this thing that mocked up a lens tearing torque. It had an orientation some 15 degrees um, off the axis, orbital axis of the disk. That's about three scale heights. Uh, clearly, if the misorientation is less than a scale height, you can hardly tell there's, there is any. Um, the specific ratio of orbital frequency to precession frequency was 15 to 1 at radius 10 in the middle of the disk. And then we ran that for 15 mid-disk orbits, which, you know, if things had followed the sort of test particle precession rate, would have been one full precession period in the middle of the disk. But we also wanted to understand more specifically what the MHD did and what the hydro did. And so we set up a parallel run that was purely hydrodynamic, no MHD and you know, no viscosity. And we took the end state of this initial 15 orbits, measured the scale height as a function of radius, the surface density as a function of radius, reproduced those in this new hydro disk, and then ran it for the same 15 orbits um, with the same torque supplied. So we have a very close parallel between hydro, pure hydro and MHD. That's right, and you know, azimuthally averaged. Yeah. Um, it couldn't be three-dimensional because, of course, there's some magnetic support in the MHD case that would go away in the hydro. So it's, it's still pretty close. Oh, and I should say, by the way, that in the process of the MHD saturating, the disk spread radially a significant amount because, of course, that's what the stresses do. Some material moves in, and their angular momentum is given to other stuff farther out that moves outward. So the actual torqued disk had a larger radial extent than this 3 to 1 ratio. So the ratio oh, this is, okay, the, this is with uh, John Zeus code. So there... Okay. Yeah, it's lossy. And in practice, the scale height increased a little bit over this stage, but I don't think changed appreciably after that. Um, and okay, so here's an animation showing more or less what happened from the initial saturation of MHD phase and now starting to the torque and precession and alignment phase. And you could see that it tilted over, particularly in the inner regions, fairly quickly at the beginning of the simulation. And by the end at time 30, you know, it's now generally tilted fairly close to the equatorial plane of those torques. So it really did align. Um, you can see that in a, another point of view in this simulation, what we're now doing is taking a slice at fixed azimuthal angle through, basically, basically shows half the disk in a sense. You know, this disk wraps all the way around to here. This dashed line will show you the mass-weighted mean plane on a given radius of the disk at a given time. This solid line shows the equatorial plane for the torques. And in watching this, I want to remind you of an artifact due to the precession, which is that if you start out with a precession, an oblique disk like this, and it processes, 
when you get around, let's see, you can sort of you know, wave my hands. <laughs> um, let's see, you start out like this, and can I do this? You know, press cesses. When you get 90 degrees around and you take a slice at fixed azimuthal angle, everything is exactly in the equatorial plane. You're just taking a cut through the middle. And then you go another 90 degrees of precession, and it'll be the opposite side of the plane. And you'll see that effect in this animation. Okay. So that's the initial get the MHD going phase. Now we have the torques. And you can see it's swinging toward the midplane. That's basically the precession. It gets to about 90 degrees and then passes through. And it looks like it's overshooting, but that's just this precession effect where you're now looking at the opposite side of the disk. And now in the later stages, you can see it aligning better and better from the inner radii out. And in the last part of the talk, um, I want to try to explain to you how all this worked on the basis of four simple basic principles. The first one is that, remember I said these torques are all strong functions of radius. They're much stronger at small radius than large. And you can see that in these space-time plots. I'm going to be showing you a lot of space-time plots. They all have the same format. Radius going this way, time going that way. In almost all of them, time will go from 15 to 30 because that's the second half of the MHD simulation, the one that had the torques. The initial direction of misalignment defined the x-axis. So this one shows the x component of the torque. This one, the y component of the torque. And we'll start with y because at t equals 0, all the torque is in the y direction. You know, it's cross product. The misalignment is in the x direction. The black hole spin quote is in the z direction, so the torque starts out in y. And then as it processes, you begin to pick up a bit of x component. And you notice in all cases, if you look at radial gradients, the sense is that this torque is pretty strongly concentrated at small radii. But the place of greatest concentration moves outward, essentially as those small radii flatten and no longer feel much torque. I also point out that this x component is positive. The misalignment is actually in the negative x direction initially. And so this is opposite the direction of the misalignment. Okay. So that's the first point. New angular momentum introduced into the system is delivered at the smallest radius that is A, a bit tilted, and B, has some mass to absorb it because, of course, the magnitude of the torque is disproportional to the mass locally. Okay. The second basic principle follows from what we've already talked about a bit, which is that once you have a warp, it produces radial flows. Another significance of this psi hat parameter is that when it's greater than unity, we said the pressure gradient is over unity, which means you basically have free expansion in the radial direction. So you can reach transonic speeds in an orbital period, and indeed those radial flow speeds are generically of order the sound speed, although depending on whether psi hat is 1 or 5, um, of order of sound speed might mean 0.5 or it might be 5. I mean, there's a fair, the, the order unity coefficient has a range to it, but it's around the sound speed. In addition, in most of the disk, the plasma beta is big. That is to say the gas pressure is larger than the magnetic pressure. And what that means is that the magnetic field is not very effective at retarding the radial flow. Its pressure is, not, is simply not great enough to do much. And we know how far the streams can move radially because basically it's limited by orbital mechanics. If you have um, an orbital speed and you give it, and that's in the azimuthal direction, you add a radial component of order of the sound speed, the ratio of the sound speed to the orbital speed is the ratio of a scale height to a radius. And so the farthest it can move out is basically of order of scale height. Simply moving at you know, near sonic speeds in this fashion 
is large enough to give a very sizable Reynolds stress, and so that can rapidly mix angular momentum from the between neighboring rings. This shows you sort of how things happen in detail. This is a contour plot, there's a linear scale, running from a little bit less than one up to five um, of the value of this psi hat parameter averaged over spherical shells. This white line travels outward at a rate equal to a half the local isothermal sound speed. The reason to follow, to think of such a track is that's the speed of a classical bending wave moving through a, twi a warped disk. And what you can see is that this white curve actually tracks this ridge line of large warp pretty well. But there's, also, there's always a good deal of fuzz, and which gets worse as you go out to larger radius. And in particular, contrasting this one with the parallel in the pure hydro case, it was clear that the turbulence created by the MHD disrupts the, the pure propagation of that bending wave. The corresponding plot for the pure hydro case has this nice smooth ridge line that just goes zoom like that and has none of these, this, these other features and irregularities. But after that bending wave passes through, um, you can see that there are subsequent episodes of short-lived strong warp and these travel more slowly outward and all of these slopes in terms of DRDT are smaller than the slope. So they're not bending waves and in fact probably best described just in a kind of kinematic fashion um, if you imagine that the um, disk starts out locally flat, gets twisted up by the differential precession and when it's twisted enough to reach psi hat of about one, that's the curve traced by this dotted white line. Okay. And if you look at any fixed radius, you can see when you twist up to make psi hat one, the disk relaxes and it's no longer so warped. And then it builds up again and so on. It's a kind of stick slip motion. And it has that episodic behavior because of this nonlinear relationship between the ability of the disk to smooth itself and the magnitude of the warp. It can do relatively little when the warp is small. It gets up to the nonlinear level and wham, the corrective mechanisms um, you know, come into play and it smooths itself back down again. Not in any clear way. You know, but basically, because you have all this MHD turbulence going on. So they will mask things like that. But well, to tell the truth, I have also not looked very closely. Um, now, this figure shows the relationship between the actual precession angle in units of pi and radius and time. And you remember I said that it would go through, if we're a test particle, it would go through one complete orbit at radius 10 over the fif 15 orbits of simulation. You compare all of these color scales, it goes a little bit at radius 10, it goes about half a precession period instead. And interestingly, you can see, even though the precession rate is this r to the minus 3 scaling, we go a you know, factor of 5 in radius, so that ought to be a factor of 100 in precession rate. In fact, there's not a hell of a lot of precession phase contrast as a function of radius. These interring couplings are very good at locking the disk into near solid body precession. It's not quite solid body. You can see by the, you know, there are definitely radial gradients, but they're a lot smaller than you'd expect on the simple model of um, independently precessing rings. And I just need to uh, supplement the battery. So I'll just that. Okay. There are these also these interesting segments where you can see um, sort of constant precession angle moving out you know, at a constant speed, you can turn that around into arguing that the warp rate, the rate of change in precession angle with radius, 
is almost linearly proportional to the mean precession rate of the whole thing. And this mean precession rate, not too surprisingly, corresponds to the precession rate you'd get at maybe 12 or 13, which is also the location of the, sorry, if you ask what's the average mass weighted average angular momentum in the disk, that corresponds to about what it is at you know, 12 or 13. Pardon? That's right, that's right, for this particular surface density profile. Okay. And now, um, having said that, there's a footnote. You know, I tried to keep this four simple basic principles. Um, it, there are a couple little complications. Um, I mentioned that the that evidence to think that the MHD turbulence disrupted propagation of that um, bending rate. And one way to see that is to contrast what happened in the MHD case with the precession as seen in the pure hydro case. And if you look closely, you'll see that there are you know, precession phase gradients here early on. But fairly rapidly, we get to a situation in which the precession phase is almost independent of radius. These contours are very flat as a function of r. And basically what happens in the hydro case is that bending wave goes out, and as soon as it passes, things get lined up. And that did not happen as nearly as effectively in the MHD case. Or in the H MHD case, you have all those <coughs> contours um, that are out of slope. Now, to underline the fact that what's important about the MHD here, it's actually not the, for the magnetic forces directly, but the turbulence that's created. These are slices at radius 10 in the middle of all the action in which I've plotted on a logarithmic scale the, radio, the magnitude of the radial force due to gas pressure, magnetic pressure, and magnetic tension. Now you probably can't see this. I'll just say that red is log minus one, yellow is log minus two and a half, Light blue is sort of log minus 3.7 or something. Um, so if you go you know, red to yellow to light blue, the gas pressure force is substantially greater than the magnetic pressure, and the magnetic pressure force is substantially greater than the magnetic tension force. So most of the action here is hydrodynamic. And I'm going to argue that the significance of the MHD part is that it's not, it is not in making the gas turbulent rather than uh, any more direct influence on dynamics. So now basic principle three is that even though the disk processes almost in solid body rotation, it doesn't quite. And the departure from solid body is what makes all the difference. And the reason is that, not surprisingly, the sense of the departure is that the inner radii lead the outer. Uh, their intrinsic precession rates are much greater. So if there's any slippage, they'll always be a little bit ahead of the outer rings. And as I pointed out when talking about the X and the Y components of the torque, what happens when an inner ring is, let's suppose, exactly 90 degrees ahead in precession phase of some outer ring, the torque it's receiving is then directed opposite the misaligned component of the angular momentum at that outer radius. And so this is newly arrived angular momentum in principle capable of canceling the misaligned angular momentum farther out. How large it is depends on the trade-off between these ratios. You know, the precession rate is this R cube scaling. On the other hand, um, the misaligned, the magnitude of the misaligned angular momentum in small radius is probably less than that at larger radius because it does align at small radius first. And then however much is delivered, these radial flows can carry that potentially canceling angular momentum out to larger radius where it can be used. And this beta is not the plasma beta. I apologize for using one symbol for two things. This is the misalignment angle, again in units of pi. It starts out at about minus 0.07 pi. And as you can see, it goes from blue, misaligned, in any given radius, to 
yellow and then red, dark red would be exactly aligned. And you know, small radii, it just gets more and more aligned. But that process happens later and later as you move out in radius. And you can see that, well, the halfway point is sort of this color, and that's moving out about like that. So there's clearly a progression of an alignment front moving outward through the disk. Okay. Which leads to second footnote to principle two. Um, which is, I argued that all these radial flows are much stronger when the psi hat thing is nonlinear is greater than one. Um, and toward the end of the story, whoops, uh, went too fast. Come back in here. You know, this stuff is misaligned by 0.01 pi radians, pretty small. It, and it's actually, it really is in the linear phase. So how do you continue to get improved alignment with time in those late stages? And the answer is that in the hydro case, this is the align same alignment diagram for the hydro. And as you can see, it does some alignment early on. That's basically the bending wave. And then it stops. Okay. Can you split the flow into shocks? Pardon? Can you split it? Yeah. Oh, you, know, you got lots of uh, weak shocks. So the flows are transonic. Is that what's called the mixing and alignment then? Basically? Well, it's part of the mixing story. Um, and... In the, other in the earlier calculation, the one about this simple hydro warp, uh, we actually looked into the entropy creation and the distribution of Mach numbers and so on. So, yeah, you know, Mach number one and a half, two, that sort of thing. But anyway, so what appears to be the lesson here is that you can get continued alignment even in the linear phase when there's turbulence to continue the mixing and the what the MHD does is to provide a continuing stirring for that turbulence. Okay. And the, now the final principle. Sorry, can you ask last thing is turbulence mixing more than the way the line story is really that accurate? Oh. <sighs> you have to think about that. Um, I'm inclined to think, actually I think no. And the reason is that the mixing rate is proportional to the magnitude of the stress. Whereas in the alpha based model, the warp diffusion rate was inversely proportional to the magnitude of the stress. So in that case, it goes exactly the opposite. Okay, so the last point to understand how this operated is what determines the speed of progression of that alignment front. And this is essentially a matter of supply and demand. You supply potentially corrective angular momentum by all the, the torque delivered internal sum radius r, and you try to apply it to the misaligned angular momentum at radius r. But in fact, what's delivered here is not going to be exactly oppositely aligned L perf. There will be some, in general, some angles. Things are ne things never perfect. And so there's this mean cosine gamma. If you look at the simulation data, that you know, efficiency factor is actually about a half. Not too bad. And now, to verify that very simple model, I've plotted what it predicts for the propagation of this level of alignment at this point for the rest of the simulation. That's the white curve, which you can see follows the track of constant alignment pretty closely. It's really no more complicated than that. Okay. And so now you can use this argument to predict where the transition rate, the transition radius should fall. Essentially, in, in mass terms, what you expect in a, in a disk of nature, not a disk of finite mass on a computer, is that it's continually being fed new obliquely orbiting matter from the outside. And meanwhile, these torques are trying to push the alignment front out in mass terms. 
and the transition front in the time steady state will be at the location where this outward speed is matched by that inward speed. And using the framework I've just described, we can just rearrange things a little bit, write the radius of the front and the transition front in gravitational units, RGs, GM over C square. And it should look something like this. And now I'm using a real lens tearing precession rate, so that's you know, the real spin parameter. And there's this dimensionless integral, which essentially describes the shape of the disk at radii just inside the transition front. It's you know, how rapidly does the alignment angle change with radius? And you know, what's the surface density profile? Because, of course, that affects how much torque gets, uh, it gets imposed. The inflow time at RF is, in general, many orbits. So this combination omega Tn should be a large number. Well, you know, A over M can be 0 and 1. This is order unity. That gives you a sense of scale for where to expect the transition radius. Ah, I forgot to say that this integral is scaled so that it basically runs from the innermost part of the disk out to the radius of the front. So 0 to 1 matches 0 to RF. In perhaps more familiar language, in terms of the original use of alpha, just for flat disk accretion rates, it would look like this. Basically, that, pro that quantity translates to this. So whichever phrasing of this you find more congenial, you can make your estimates for where to expect the transition from. And with that, I want to come to the close. And I think perhaps the almost the most important point to make is that it actually is feasible with some labor um, to do a real calculation of this problem, which it wasn't until quite recently. What you see when you do is that this the radial pressure gradients created by the twists and warps drive these radial flows that are very good at almost keeping it in a solid body. Um, but the departure from the solid body, the precession phase gradient, leads to the opportunity to transport angular momentum that can cancel misaligned angular momentum and align the disk. The progress of that alignment can actually be modeled quite simply on this, on this supply and demand basis. And I must confess, as someone who's uh, spent a lot of time emphasizing the importance of MHD effects, it was, um, shall we say, modesty enhancing <laughs> um, to discover that really the effect of MHD here is not in terms of um, directly pu pulling things around or directly transporting angular momentum, which is what I, what I expected it to do, but rather in terms of just creating a turbulent background. The big change is tr um, transforming the problem from laminar to turbulent. And with that summary, I want to emphasize that this is only the beginning of the story. And just a s kind of sampling of question, interesting questions that remain open. And you know, I truly don't know the answers to these questions, but you know, be thinking about you know, what is that profile? I, have, I can tell you what the front profile was for these particular circumstances. I cannot tell you what it will be like for a different surface density profile, for a different H over R, and, and so on and so on. Another interesting question is if you imagine that all these radial flows are good at keeping the psi hat to be r not too large, not more than several perhaps, and then you ask, the disk is thin, how many E foldings in radius do you need to transition from this orientation to that orientation? You know, to go a radian, you'll need, let's say, um, you know, a third times r over h, or a fifth times r over h, e foldings. That could be a very large number of e foldings. But often disks may not have that radial dynamic range <laughs> available. You know, imagine a disk in a binary, and there's an outer tidal cutoff, and there's an inner cutoff at, let's say, the ISCO of the um, uh, around the black hole. <laughs> 
And that's all the room you have. And there are some alpha hydro SPH simulations recently by Chris Nixon, Andrew King, in which they argue that there are actually um, breaks between this alignment and that alignment when things get too severe. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in an MHD environment. And I don't know the answer. Um, another, of course, observational interest is it would be great if we can define the character of this alignment front to find, find some observational signature with which we can test this stuff. That's unclear. Right. So, um, as I said, I see this as having laid some groundwork for um, a new development in the field and some initial accomplishments, but there's plenty more to look into. And that's the best place to stop. distinguish between his published work and his more recent work, um, which he told me about privately last week at a workshop. Um, what he's done is fully general relativistic MHD of a rather thicker disk and a disk rather closer to the central black hole. And indeed, he finds basically solid body precession. And more recently, he's done a simulation of disk that's a similar thickness to this, A over R, a tenth, he said, and with a larger radial extent than previously, but around a but rather small misalignment from a curved black hole with spin parameter of only 0.1. So he was looking at a case of fairly weak toys. And again, he says, found solid body precession. Now, I've not seen any data. This is all, you know, he's sketch a picture on a pad and talk about words. You shouldn't be held to my description. Um, I can speculate about the difference, but you know, without really testing in the data, I don't know for sure. And my suspicion is that he's an original, if we can go back to here, because he is A, a small body of this, and B, is pretty close, looking things pretty close in. That for the duration of simulation, you don't see much precession very far from the black hole. Now, for a spin parameter of 0.1, the ISCO is at you know, 5 and something, in RG units, M units. And he was looking at, let's say, 10 RG following precession. That's close enough to the ISCO that the inflow rate is already pretty fast. And my suspicion is that this quantity is relatively small for that reason. And so, um, in effect, the alignment front is held cl so close in that he can't see. But you know, this is, this is speculation and guesswork, and I don't know, without really looking at the data, I don't know for sure. Next. What is the outer in a normal orthogonal? Pardon? What is the outer? Oh, oh, okay, 90 degree. Yes, a wound is just a mess or a transition. Good question. Um, and my hunch is that whichever side it's you know, slightly this way or slightly that way, it will go the near way to a line. But in this room who've done these simulations, you pro I suspect you probably shared my experience of um, a priori guesses about nonlinear fluid mechanics. 
Okay, well, uh, we, so if there's more questions for Julian, we can uh, ask him over cookies. Uh, and I'm, we'll be taking him to dinner tonight, so if you want to come with, let me know uh, sooner rather than later, please. So let's thank Julian again. And we'll be around tomorrow if you want to meet with him.